And uh, so, so glad to have each of you in the service. And again, um, we're thankful to have a number of people listen to us uh, via our live stream, then also our recording later on. So it's great to have them a part of our service as well today. So however you're tuning in, it is going to be a great time together. Over the last number of weeks, we've been looking at um, a series of messages, actually the last two weeks, and this will be the third part three in a series called A Decade to Make a Difference. And as we start 2020, this is a brand new decade. This is a brand new 10 years ahead of us if we measure things by decades. Uh, 10 years, and what are we going to do to make a difference in the lives around us, maybe even make a difference in our own life? And again, we're convinced that the way you make that difference is that you draw near to God and He will draw near to you. And so this morning, as we look at today's message, I want to share a message entitled, I'm Invited. And as I deliver this message, I want us to walk through a passage of Scripture together that you can kind of you can power up your Bible, if that's what you do, if it's on your tablet or our phone, or you can open up to Luke chapter 7, verses 36 to 50. I'm going to read it in just a moment, and so you can put your finger in there. But it's a great passage that ties into this theme today that I'm invited, and, and how Jesus invites people that others reject. And today, as we get into this message, I want us here at Spotlight somehow to become very compassionate, very much uh, in tune with the fact that one of the greatest things that we can do is to invite others to discover what Jesus wants to do in their life, to invite others to, to come to church, to invite others, even more important than going to church, is discovering who Christ is. And so... Um, over the past couple of days, Helen and I, we've had an opportunity to be away at a minister's and spouse's retreat, and, um, and so it's always nice to get away. But one of the things that the speaker said that day, and I thought, I leaned over and I said to Helen, I said, that ties into my message for this Sunday, and is that how the Bible teaches that we are the body of Christ. Some of you are earlobes, some of you are noses, some of you are eyes, but together we all play a part within the body of Christ. But do you know what the most important part of the body really is? Anybody want to take a guess? The heart. The heart. Well, that's a good one. I would, I would put that right up there. But I would submit to you that in addition to the heart would be the elbow. And the elbow, the elbow is the part where you put your arm on and says, Come on, join me in this journey. Come on, I want to invite you to come along with me. And sometimes in the body of Christ... We are so many of the other parts of the, that we forget about the importance of inviting people to join us in this journey about what it means to follow Jesus. And so today, as we look at this message, I'm really excited about the fact that Jesus was someone who learned to invite others. He learned to invite others to join him in the journey and put his arm out, put his elbow out, and says, come, follow me and, and, and join me in this journey. And so today, as we share this time together, if we're going to make a difference in the decade to come, I submit to you that the way we make a difference is that we can have all the wonderful things there are, but if we don't invite others to discover Jesus and to, to be a part of this journey, we're missing a big part of what it's all about. And so as a church family, this message, and I'm going to skip right to the end, so don't leave, all right, after I say this. But skipping right to the end is I want somehow for us to be reminded that we need to invite others on this journey of discovering about Christ. And in particular, we need to follow the example of Jesus, how Jesus invited the people that others rejected. And so in Luke chapter 7 that we're going to look at in just a moment, it's all about one of those stories where Jesus welcomed and invited someone that no one else would invite. He was open to other people that the, the, the religious establishment of that day would not open themselves up to. And so when I think of the word invited and when I was preparing for my message, I don't know about you, but the worst feeling I think there is is to not be invited. You ever, and I don't answer this out loud, all right, but you ever had that feeling where something was going on and everyone else got invited, got invited but you didn't? And you ever had that feeling where you were left out, you were uninvited? And um, I talked to a young person recently that even with social media that they noticed on their Instagram feed that everyone seems to be having a great time at this event, 
but they didn't get invited to that event. And so social media just kind of makes that a little more acute of how people can see things going on but feeling like they're left out. And as I was looking and thinking about this message, I thought, wow, that is so true. The feeling of being left out or uninvited is something that is just, it's just not very pleasant at all. And so for many of us, maybe it's not on a social media or an event, but maybe in life there have been times where we felt unwanted. Maybe we feel like we weren't worthy to hang out with somebody or worthy to be a part of something. Maybe you were undeserving or maybe someone did make you feel unwelcome in life. But when it comes to modeling and living out the way Jesus wants us to live, folks, we need to make sure that here at Spotlight Church, and we can't speak for anybody else, that we follow the model of Jesus and we invite everybody to be a part of this journey. Even those that maybe others reject and say, wow, they're too bad or they're too this or they're too that. We need to have that spirit in us that says we need to invite others to discover who Jesus is. So in Luke chapter 7, verses 36 to 50, I want to take the time to read this story. And it says this, beginning to read at verse 36. It says, when one of the Pharisees, and that Pharisee, his name was Simon. So when, when Simon invited, and there's that word, when Simon invited Jesus to have dinner with him, he went to the Pharisee's house and he reclined at the table. A woman in that town, so that's code for streetwalker, hooker, or a call girl, whatever uh, derogative that they probably you know, would think of. It says, a woman in that town who lived a sinful life learned that Jesus was eating at the Pharisee's house. And so she came there with an alabaster jar of perfume, very rich. And as she stood before him at his feet weeping, she began to wet his feet with her tears. Then she wiped them with her hair kissed them, and poured perfume on them. And when the Pharisees who had invited him saw this, he said to himself, if this man were a prophet, he would know who is touching him and what kind of woman she is, that she is a sinner. And Jesus answered him, Simon, I have something to tell you. Tell me, teacher, he said. Two people owed money to a certain money lender. One owed him 500 denarii, the other owed him 50. Neither of them had the money to pay him back, so he forgave the debts of both. Now which of them will love him more? Simon replied, I suppose the one who had the bigger debt forgiven. You have judged correctly, Jesus said. Then he turned to the woman, and he said, and he said to Simon, Do you see this woman? I came into your house, and you did not give me any water for my feet. But she wet my feet with her tears and wiped them with her hair. You did not give me a kiss, but this woman from the time I entered has not stopped kissing my feet. You did not put oil on my head, but she has poured perfume on my feet. Therefore I tell you, her many sins have been forgiven, as her great love has shown. But whoever has been forgiven little, loves little. Then Jesus said to her, Your sins are forgiven. The other guests said, to them, said among themselves, Who is this who even forgives sins? And Jesus said to the woman, Your faith has saved you. Go in peace. What a great passage. Here was Jesus invited by Simon into a house. He was invited to uh, be a part of that party back then. And of course, back then they were all testing, wanted to test Jesus to see who really, he w really was. But as he was invited into the house, Simon um, decided to throw him a party. And of course, when you throw a party back then, okay, so when you think of party, I don't know what you think of. Maybe you're thinking they grilled hot dogs. They maybe had on the latest, hottest uh, Jewish wrap. I don't know. Maybe, that, maybe that's what you are thinking of as a party. I don't, I don't know what it would be. But there wasn't that kind of a party that they had. A party back then, when the Pharisees threw a party, it was kind of a party where people sit around and just talked. It was a public discussion where you would share your collective ignorance or your collective brilliance, wherever, whatever it happened to be. And, but it was a party where people just sit around and, and just kind of talked about politics and the things of the day. And, and that was the kind of party that the Pharisees had. And so in this party that Simon invited Jesus to was sort of the who's who 
of the Pharisees. Pharisees being those that were the religious, the very scholarly type, at least they thought of themselves. And so I can kind of picture this party in my mind, and I want to walk you through this passage. It's a little bit different than the way I normally uh, deliver a message, but I think it's important that, that we walk through this message. And so at the Pharisees that were gathered there that day, just kind of picture in your mind that they probably had on their best robes, they had on their best uh, tassels that were hanging down all over off their robes. They were, they were probably, um, if I understand correctly, si at Simon's house, there is an outer room that kind of is like a porch area around the house. And in this outer room, they would set up tables and people would recline at the table, you know, with your head sort of here and your feet laying here, but you would be laying down. I would love to eat that way, by the way, honey. I, I would love to eat that way. Um, I could just go to sleep after the meal. It would be very quick. It would be nice. All right. So they're all reclining in this porch area. And outside the porch area, the public, the people who were not invited, could sort of come and, and listen to these scholarly people as they had their big discussions. That was the kind of party that Jesus was invited to. That was the kind of party he was asked to come and be a part of. And, and so it was, it, was, it was quite the thing. And so they would leave the door open. Uh, people, common people that day would listen. And during that time, they would talk about social trends, politics, theology, and maybe even some stranger things. Who knows? Back then, in case you didn't know it, they didn't have internet, all right? They didn't have TV. They couldn't watch, you know, the Real Housewives of Jerusalem or anything like that. Um, they just kind of had to go and listen to these Pharisees talk, talk, talk about all these different things. It was kind of the reality TV of the day and uh, where they would go and just take it in. But in the midst of all this, and I want you to notice verse 37 of that passage. A woman in that town who lived a sinful life. Again, the town prostitute. Look what she did. How she came with an alabaster jar of perfume and she walks into that party and so here at this party, or the Pharisees, they are probably waxing eloquently about, you know, sort of the ontological arguments of pneumatology. They were probably looking at sacerdotalism and looking at the pros and cons of that. And I don't even know what I just said, all right? But they were probably waxing eloquently about these, all these big subjects. But in comes this town prostitute. And she walks right into the party. She walks into the party, and all of a sudden the Pharisees, they were just, oh, how could she be in here? Why would she even walk in here? She is unclean. She's unworthy. She's impure. She doesn't belong. She wasn't invited. That woman, she was hurting. That woman that probably none of them really knew, at least they, they don't, didn't act like they knew her. But that woman was a real person. That woman was probably someone who made some bad choices in her life. Probably when she was a little girl, she never set out to be a prostitute. She never set out to be a call girl. Maybe that young girl at one time wanted to be a teacher. Maybe she wanted to sell real estate. Maybe she wanted to be a stay-at-home mom and take care of the dozen children or so. Who knows? She had other dreams. She never set out to be the town prostitute. But yet, here she was. For whatever reason, she was looked down upon. She was recognized for her sinful life that she lived. Maybe, maybe if you begin to dig into her past life, you'll discover some things that happened to her. Maybe she had a boyfriend who pressured her um, and got her pregnant and then rejected her. Maybe she, because of her circumstances, became unemployable and everyone began to look down on her and she had no choice to make a living and to do it in a way that was totally inappropriate, sinful. Maybe her whole, whole life she had been uh, used and abused by people in her life. Maybe men used and abused her. Maybe other women looked down on her and glared at her hatefully. But in came this woman into this party who was uninvited. I want to stop here and say that if you've ever had those moments where you felt like you were uninvited, if you ever had those times where you felt like you didn't belong, I just know that I don't want you to have those feelings when you come to Spotlight. I just know I don't want you to 
have those feelings when you come to Jesus and he begins to look at your life and, and you begin to say, you know what, I'm such a horrible person, God could never forgive me. That's not true. God will, can forgive you. God can invite you to turn your life around and to start over. And so that woman, she felt not welcome, not invited. But here she goes and into this party and past all the glares of these men, she probably had to make her journey in from someplace else and people kind of jeered at her and looked at her and said, where do you think you're going? You're going right into the Pharisee's house, the religious people? But she walks right in and she kneels down in a posture of worship. She breaks the jar of perfume. That jar of perfume was worth years of, mo of salary, of money. And she breaks that and she pours it over Jesus' feet and she gives Jesus the most valuable possession that she has. This woman that's invited gave Jesus the most valuable possession that she had. And when I was studying this, I was asking myself the question, what have I given to Jesus? What have I been willing to, to sacrifice and to really say, you know what, I present myself as a Christian, really, what am I willing to give to Jesus? What am I willing to sacrifice? This woman sacrificed the most valuable thing she had. Sometimes in the 21st century, we have people running around professing the name of Jesus who really, at the heart of it, they're willing to say, yeah, I'll be a Christian, but don't ask me to sacrifice. Don't ask me to be you know, radically devoted to Christ. I want to encourage us here at Spotlight that we need to realize that we need to worship. We need to kneel down and worship. We need to give Jesus the most valuable thing we can. And, and for me, as I thought about that question, is to give Jesus my life. And so at the age of 16, that's exactly what I did. And whatever age you are, I hope you made that same decision to say, Lord, I want to give you all that I have, all my flaws, my failures. I want to give you all my warts and my wrinkles. I want to give you everything because it's all I have to give. And the Lord invites us to do that. This woman, this town prostitute, she gave an extravagant gift of worship. In that moment, it was her repentance. In that moment when she did that, when she gave all that she had, that was the moment she was repenting and saying, Jesus, I heard you earlier today, or I heard you talking about love and forgiveness. I heard you, Jesus, talking about unconditional love and how you want to redeem us. And when she came barging into that party and when she broke the alabaster jar and gave the most valuable thing she had, it was in that moment that she said, Lord, I believe. I repent. I give everything I have to you. I'm leaving my old life. I no longer want to be looked upon as a prostitute. I want to start my life new. And again, I wonder how many of us, we have that same cry of our heart Sure, we may not fit ourselves into the image of what the, the town prostitute is, but maybe we think we've done things that just cannot be forgiven. Maybe we have things that are still messing up our life today. We can't get past it. We still have the scars from it. Folks, I'm here to remind you today that Jesus is inviting you to lay all that down at his feet. Jesus is inviting you to give the most valuable thing you have and begin to start your life over. Hit the reset button and say, Lord, here I am. Help me to leave the old life behind and to begin again. What a great story and how she knew that from Jesus she was invited to do that. Verse 38 says, as she stood behind him at his feet weeping, she began to wet his feet with her tears. Then she wiped them with her hair. I mean, can you, that was incredible. And, and I don't know if you knew this, but Jewish women in those days didn't even unbind their hair. They didn't even let their hair hang down. And if they did, it was certainly not in a public forum. Uh, even, even the worst of women of that day, if you want to put her in that category, would not have done that. But here she unbinds her hair and she wipes his feet with her hair. And she pours perfume. No towels to dry his feet. Just her hair. And of course, in the world's eyes, how inappropriate that was. How inappropriate it was. 
Then in verse 39, it says, When the Pharisee who had invited Jesus saw this, he said to himself, Wow, if this man were a prophet, if Jesus really were a prophet, he would know who is touching him and what kind of woman she is, that she is a sinner. You see, Simon assumed that Jesus didn't realize the woman was a prostitute. Jesus knew exactly who she was. And of course, Simon, in his religious narrowness and his perspective, he, he just said, wow, he, couldn't, he can't be God, he can't be a prophet, because he would never let that happen. And Jesus basically responds at that time and says, oh yeah, let me show you. I can read your mind. And then Jesus speaks to the woman, tells her all the wonderful things she's done in that passage in verses 44 to 48. And, and at the end of that passage, he says, Jesus says to her, your sins are forgiven. I can't, uh, I can't think of a few short words that are more powerful than that. Your sins are forgiven. This woman, this woman who was uninvited, this woman who probably rock, walked across the city, she walked in front of the people who were sitting around the outside of that porch that day. And she comes into Simon's house and she darts straight to Jesus. How scandalous. How disgraceful. How appalling that she would do that. Why did she do that? She did that because she knew Jesus is the one who could help her start her life over. I want to remind you today that there are people, there are moms and dads, there are teenagers and young adults and boys and girls who are looking for an opportunity to be invited to start their life over our city of Stratford right here is full of incredible people but it's also full of, full of people who probably lots of people would reject but you know what they need Jesus and we need to be reminded that we need to be the kind of church that says if you feel uninvited, you are invited here. You can come and discover this Jesus who can hit the reset button on your life and help you to start life over. There may be the religious among us who would say, how scandalous, how disgraceful that that person would behave that way. But you know what? We need to say, you're invited. You're invited. Let me introduce you to Jesus. This woman, she was the one, I think, who could benefit from what we read earlier in, in Matthew chapter 11. Come to me, all who are weary and heavy burdened, and I will give you rest. There are lots of people within our city, maybe even some of you sitting here today. Your life is full of burdens, and you're looking for rest. You're looking for hope. And that hope will only be found in Christ. And when you come to him and you begin to give him the most valuable thing you have, when you give him your alabaster jar, he will say to you, I am gentle, I am patient, I am compassionate, I am humble in heart. Uh, here's your rest that you've been looking for. There are always people around who will point out like there was in that day, the woman's sin. But just by pointing out somebody's sin doesn't lead them away from their sin. Just by judging her in that day for her lifestyle didn't change her lifestyle. Shaming her, as many people did back then, that woman, it didn't set her free. What changed her life is Jesus said, you're invited. You're welcomed. Come to me, all you who are weary, all you who want to move away from the darkness in your life and move to the light. The Bible reminds us that Jesus came not for the righteous. Jesus came for the sinners. He came for that woman. He came for you. He came for me. Jesus did not come for the healthy, but he came for those who were sick. And again, I submit to you this morning that Jesus invites the people to come who others reject. So, this morning as I close out this message, 
if you're here and you've ever doubted God, if you've ever questioned God, if you've ever been what you thought was hurt by God, maybe you've tried to walk away from God, maybe, maybe you feel like in your life you failed God, I want to remind you today, you're still invited to come and to hit the reset button and start life over again. Maybe in your life, maybe you've gone through a bankruptcy. Maybe at some time in your life you considered suicide. Maybe sometime in your life you even cursed God. Maybe you even did something, um, like commit adultery or something like that. I want to remind you today that even those things aren't good, you're still invited. You're still invited. This morning, I can't think of a greater message for this decade ahead of us. Here at Spotlight, if we're going to make a difference in the decade to come, it's because we have the same attitude that Jesus did. It's because we stop putting out excuses and we start inviting people to come and to join us. I love that, you know, there's lots of things going on around us, but in our lives here today, we need to remind ourselves that Jesus is calling us to take time Stop making excuses, stop being busy, stop saying, well, I had to do this, or I'm too tired, or, and begin to look around and see the people amongst us who need to be invited. Invited to hit the reset button in their life and to come to Christ. You know, in that room that day, it was full and overflowing. But it's interesting to me as I look at that story in Lucas 7, and I close with this, that in that room that was filled with all the religious people, there was still room for one more. And that woman came into the party. Even though she wasn't invited by the Pharisees, she was invited by Jesus. And when she came into that party, into that room, Jesus essentially said to her, do you know what? You're invited too. You're valuable. You're worth something. This morning, if we're going to make a difference in the decade to come, we need to do the same thing. We need to invite people to come to Jesus, regardless of their background, regardless of what they're struggling with, regardless of the scars and all those things, and tell them to come, to come, and to give the best they have to Jesus. And he will take that, and he will say like he said to that woman, my child, your sins are forgiven. I can't think of any greater words. And at the age of 16, when I was reminded that's what Jesus did for me, wow, what a burden lifts off the shoulders. In spite of my failures and flaws, what an incredible thing it was to know that I was invited to be a part of what Jesus was doing. Our worship team is going to come and, and we're going to sing one final song in closing today, and and it talks about God's amazing grace. And as they come and as they lead us in this closing song, I want us to just think about where we are in our journey with the Lord. I want you to think about your neighbors. I want you to think about maybe people you've come across. And maybe it's time that here at Spotlight Church that we realize that everyone is invited But have we taken time to put the most important part of our body out there, the elbow, and say, come along with me. Let me introduce you to the one who can change your life profoundly. To hit the reset button and begin a life over and to remind them they're invited. Today, maybe some of you, I don't know. I don't know your life personally. But maybe you need to be reminded that Jesus is calling you to come to you. He wants to give you rest for your soul. Maybe you're busy fighting every battle that rages around you. But Jesus is saying, come to me. Come to me and I will give you that rest. Let's stand together in closing. As our worship team leads us, think about God's amazing grace and what he wants to do if we would just come to him and help others to do the same thing.